Dr. Pauling has a major academic reputation. After receiving his PhD from California Institute of Technology, he stayed on for 40 years as a member of the faculty at that institution, but also served faculty appointments at Stanford University, Oxford University, Harvard, MIT. He's received honorary doctorates from over 40 institutions, including the University of Chicago, Yale, Cambridge, Oxford, University of London, Paris, Krakow, and University of Berlin. And I won't name the other 28 or whatever. Dr. Pauling has a major scientific reputation with the publication of over 600 scientific research papers and major discoveries in nuclear structure, in the nature of the chemical bond, the structure of gas molecules, and many other works of research and scientific papers that have been published. Also in the application of quantum mechanics and research in the application of chemistry to biological and medical problems. He's received dozens of medals and awards for his scientific work, including, I suppose, the best known the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1954. Dr. Pauling's major reputation of recent years has been as an advocate for vitamins in the extension of well-being in life. It was on that topic that we were pleased to have him on Grand Valley's campus last evening, uh, speaking on vitamins and better health. But perhaps it could be said that in spite of the major reputations in the academic and scientific and health fields, that perhaps it's been Dr. Pauling's reputation as a moral leader and as one who has sought to bring rationality to the international scene, especially in light of the develop developments making nuclear war possible. It was in the 1950s that he became aware of the long-term dangers of low radiation produced by nuclear testing. And it was that realization that led him and his wife to hundreds of speeches around the world and petition drives involving thousands of scientists, petitioning the United Nations, petitioning the White House, petitioning on both sides of the Atlantic for a ban on atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. You may recall the scene where, before he went into a reception with President Kennedy, he spent a few hours outside the White House picketing the White House uh, on this issue. Remember, this was in the 50s and took place during the era of McCarthy, and this was at sacrifice to his reputation and at sacrifice to some of the scientific work that he was working on. He has told us about some of the grants that were refused until he could resubmit them in an, an associate's name because our own government was afraid to be accused of giving a, a scientific grant to someone with the name of Linus Pauling. The crusade, crusade that he engaged in in the 1950s and early 60s was successful and led to the Test Ban Treaty of 1963 that was signed by the Soviet Union, Britain, and the United States. An interesting historical point, he was awarded, was given that Nobel, the Nobel Prize for that on the day that the treaty became effective in October of 1963. Dr. Pauling's moral leadership for peace, which led to his second Nobel Prize, making him the only person in the history of the Nobel Awards to have received two unshared Nobel Prizes. That commitment to peace is one that he has continued to this day. So perhaps the bit of rationality that he has brought and the attempts that he has made to make this a safer world rivals the other major reputations that he has given us as a scientist and academic leader and one who is concerned about our health. So it's with great pleasure that we present tonight Dr. Linus Pauling. Thank you. We are fortunate people, you and I, to be living uh, at this stage of history and living in this country, in one of the developed countries in the world. Uh, 
The world has changed a great deal during the last 200 years, 100 years, especially during this century. Uh, changed in every way. Uh, and one of the ways, of course, is the way of, uh, the wa way of waging wars. Here, we don't have nearly so much suffering as uh, 100 years ago or 80 years ago or 60 years ago in the developed countries. There's still plenty of suffering in the world as a whole. I remember when there wasn't any social security, unemployment insurance or doles. Uh, poor people, people out of work, just had uh, a miserable time, starving to death some of them, even in the United States. Well, it still goes on to some extent, but uh, there have been, there's been great progress in the developed countries. Uh, I am happy to have the belief that in the course of time, we can build a world in which every human being can lead a good life, but we're still far from that now. I began to be active in the field of politics in 1945, when the first nuclear weapons were exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I had felt for a long time, since the time I was a student in Oregon Agricultural College, that uh, war was not a very good sort of activity for human beings. The First World War involved a tremendous sacrifice in young human beings, young men especially, and uh, it didn't seem to me to make very good sense. But uh, it also didn't seem to me that there was any prospect that uh, human beings could get rid of the institution of war. And of course, we have nearly the same situation now, but not quite the same. In 1945, when the atomic bombs were exploded, I had the same feelings as expressed by Albert Einstein, that now that a single bomb could destroy a city and be lobbed over by a single rocket, uh, the time had really come when we needed to abolish war from the world. And Einstein said, uh, what we need now is a new way of thinking. And it's clear, if you listen to President Reagan, that we haven't yet developed this new way of thinking after 40 years now. Well, uh, nevertheless, I'm hopeful. I remember a few months ago last year, uh, I saw an article which was uh, in Hospital Medicine, I believe, I'm not sure about the journal. Uh, someone had interviewed me. And at the end of the article, I read that he asked me a question after I'd been talking about uh, nuclear war and the need to uh, have peace in the world, uh, the possibility that the human race will be destroyed if these nuclear weapons are used. He said, uh, but Dr. Pauling, do you have hope? Uh, I said, of course I have hope. If I didn't have hope, I wouldn't be spending my time going around giving lectures about uh, nuclear war and the need for world peace. I'd just be enjoying myself. And so he said, uh, how would you be enjoying yourself? And I said, uh, I'd be making quantum mechanical calculations about molecular structures. Well, after all, last year I was 83 years old. If I'd been somewhat younger, I could have thought of another answer, perhaps, to that question. <laughs> Well, there's reason for me to be hopeful. Here we are in a world in which war between the great nations has now been abolished. Forty years have gone by since the Second World War, and there hasn't been the Third World War. Only 20 years went by between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second World War. And of course, there was a very strong, still is very strong, anti-communist feeling and strong anti-capitalist feeling. Uh, if it weren't for the existence of nuclear weapons, well, uh, 
statements of this sort don't really have much meaning, but I'll go ahead and make it anyway. Uh, almost surely there would have been a great war between the United States and the Soviet Union, or the capitalist countries and the communist countries. So we can be hopeful. We aren't going to have, we don't have a war, a nuclear war involving great nuclear powers. There are still wars going on. But, uh, and it's going to be a long time before we are able to get rid of them. Uh, feelings are so strong between the different sects that are fighting in Lebanon, for example. The uh, rich people and the poor people in Nicaragua, with the rich people supporting the Contras and trying to overthrow the present government, and other wars. It's going to be a hard job to get rid of war completely on earth. In my Nobel Peace Prize address, I discuss the question of how we can avoid the necessity for wars of liberation to overthrow an oppressive and dictatorial government. It will probably be a hundred years before we have a world system such that wars of liberation will not need to be fought. So I think it's wonderful that uh, the United States and other Western powers have not engaged in a great war against the communist countries that perhaps would have involved uh, with using conventional weapons, uh, killing 60 million or 80 million or 100 million people, tremendous amount of human suffering. But there's still a possibility that a nuclear war will occur. Uh, almost everyone who studies these problems thinks that it's not going to occur by a conscious decision, definite decision of the national leaders to initiate the war. But it may occur as a result of some accident, a psychological or technological accident that initiates the interchange of these terrible weapons. And of course, what we have been doing during the last 20 or 30 years is to increase the probability of such an accident. We keep, keep introducing new, more and more complicated weapons. And as the weapons become more and more complicated, the probability of an accident becomes greater and greater. So uh, we have the job of fighting to prevent this catastrophe, this ultimate catastrophe. Up until a couple of years ago, uh, there were discussions as to how many human beings would survive a nuclear war. And uh, in general, it was thought that some human beings would survive a nuclear war. The human race wouldn't be wiped out. During the last couple of years, there's been much discussion of the nuclear winter. It has been recognized that if these nuclear weapons were to be used, there would be tremendous amounts of soil and steel buildings and human beings and so on, vaporized, condensing into dust in the atmosphere, and a great amount of smoke produced by the burning of cities and the burning of forests. Perhaps most of the forests would burn. Uh, this dust and smoke would shield the surface of the earth from the sunlight so that the plants would die, nearly all plants would die, the animals would die, human beings would die, uh, would become very cold, people would die, be frozen to death. Now, the, there's still uncertainty as to just how serious this nuclear freeze would be, but it's believed that it would affect the whole Earth, that people in the southern hemisphere, in areas where nuclear weapons weren't exploded, also would be killed in the nuclear winter. The estimates, there were some estimates uh, last year in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists of effects of a nuclear war in which a, a, a quarter or a fifth or a sixth of the nuclear weapons that now exist were used. The standard nuclear war, 10,000 megatons, for 30 years. 10,000 megatons has been used as a normal molecular, a normal nuclear war. And it was concluded by these analysts in this recent, these recent studies that 
a billion to two billion people would be killed in the initial attack, and perhaps a billion or two billion people caused would die from uh, local radioactive fallout, rather immediate effects within 60 days of the local radioactivity. And uh, similar numbers of people would die uh, because of lack of medical attention, die, freeze to death because of the nuclear winter, starve to death because of the deaths of all animals and of plants, almost all plants. An extinction like the great extinction of 65 million years ago that where all the dinosaurs died and most species of animals died. Um, some small mammals survived and evolved into the larger species of mammals, including human beings, ultimately. And that, it is thought, that the great extinction of 65 million years ago was caused by the dust produced by the collision of an 11 kilometer diameter meteorite with the earth when it and 10 times its mass of earth were vaporized, condensed into a cloud of dust that shielded the earth from the sunlight for perhaps a year. So this is what might happen again through the use of these nuclear weapons. 25, 30 years ago, when I was talking about nuclear weapons, I got involved at first very quickly after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was asked by the Rotary Club in Hollywood to give a talk at their luncheon about uh, nuclear weapons, which I did. Almost entirely scientific, just what nuclear fission is that uh, when nuclear fission occurs for a given amount of material that undergoes fission you get 20 million times as much energy released as for the by the explosion of that amount of TNT or dynamite 20 million times and uh, gradually as I talked I began talking about the need to eliminate war I was invited by Albert Einstein to join the Einstein committee it consisted only of uh, seven scientists constituting the board of trustees to educate the American people about this situation. And so for many years I gave scores or even a hundred talks a year about uh, this matter of nuclear weapons. And here I am still doing it. For a little while when there was detente I thought things were going along pretty well and that I didn't need to make this sacrifice. I could just enjoy myself making those quantum mechanical calculations. But now, again, I'm pretty worried about this matter. People need to understand to know what the situation is in order that they can take the proper action. I wish the members of Congress understood better and weren't so uh, susceptible to pressure from the administration. I wish that they uh, felt strongly enough to vote their own convictions and not just to vote in accordance with expediency when they are threatened with having defense contracts taken away from their constituents and so on. People need to understand. I get discouraged from time to time about the lack of understanding. Uh, two or three years ago, I saw an advertisement, which I cut out. I've lost it now. I think it was by an oil company in a slick paper magazine. And why, why, they, why that advertisement appeared, I no longer remember. It showed a town, a small city, pretty much smashed by an explosion, high explosive. I remember 19... 39, I think it was, my wife and I were driving back to Oregon, and 1959, perhaps, well, uh, anyway, we were driving back to Oregon and passed through Roseburg, where there had been an accidental explosion the day before. A truck with six tons of dynamite had been parked in the business section, sort of the warehouse section, overnight and for some reason the six tons of dynamite exploded in the middle of the night and smashed 
six city blocks pre-flat. Just six tons of dynamite. Well, this advertisement said that 500 tons of dynamite exploded with megaton might. Here, the officers of the oil company no doubt are smart people interested in making money. And the people working for the advertising firm uh, were are smart people. And here they made a mistake of by a factor of 2,000. It would take 2,000 times 500 tons of dynamite to be a megaton of explosive power. A megaton is a million tons equivalent of TNT or dynamite. So these smart people can hear that our present stockpiles, the United States, Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, a little bit, uh, come to about 60 thousand megatons. They don't know what that means, 60,000 megatons, because they make a mistake by a factor of 2,000. A freight train carrying 500 tons of dynamite might be about a mile long. To carry 2,000 times 500 tons of dynamite, you'd need a freight train that was 2,000 miles long just to carry one megaton. And the stockpiles are 60,000 megatons. During the whole of the Second War, six megatons of high explosives were used, three megatons in bombs and three megatons in propellants and so on. So the stockpile is 10,000 times the amount of explosives used in the whole of the Second World War. And of course, much of this, say a sixth of it, 10,000 megatons, might well be exploded in the first day of the nuclear war instead of being spread out over five years. There's little doubt that our civilization would be destroyed if there were a nuclear war. And it's quite likely that the human race would cease to exist. Perhaps it would be an extinction like that extinction 65 million years ago when the 18 uh, Species of dinosaurs all were suddenly extinguished. Well, we can ask, uh, what's wrong with what we are doing? Here we are. We're not going to have a war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Unless there is an accident, and the probability of this accident gets greater, the more we fiddle with the weapons. Why do we keep fiddling with the weapons? Moreover, why do we keep increasing the military budget with the Soviet Union following along in our path? I saw an analysis in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists again of the military expenditures. If we reduce our military expenditures, a year later the Soviet Union reduces theirs. If we increase ours, well, they, there's a lag time of a year about in the amount of money spent on militarism. Uh, the lag time as a whole, of course, is somewhat greater, four or five years. We built first nuclear weapons and exploded them in 1945. The Soviet Union exploded their first nuclear weapon, the first bomb, in 1949, four years later. We started introducing MIRV, MIRVing our weapons, big rocket carrying 12 or 18 smaller rockets with uh, computers and each with a nuclear warhead uh, so that they could, uh, instead of destroying one city, could destroy 12 or 18 cities. Being 1969. By 1974, the Soviet Union was well on their way toward <coughs> Mervin. We've been introducing cruise missiles, and the Soviet Union is has carried out studies, they're developing cruise missiles. In about four years, they'll be installing a lot of these cruise missiles, which are very dangerous weapons. The, uh, we boycotted the Olympic Games in 1980. They boycotted the Olympic Games in 1984, the standard lag time of four years. The, uh, why, why do we why are we continually now in the recent years increasing the military budget? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have a war with the Soviet Union. 
It doesn't make sense to make the weapons more complicated, increasing the chance of an accident. What would make sense would be to start saving money, not wasting the world's wealth in this way in a completely irrational manner. Start saving money. There are plenty of problems, plenty of ways in which this money could be used. Well, of course, uh, one argument against doing this is that the Soviet Union and the Soviet people would benefit twice as much as we would. If we were to cut our military budget by $100 billion a year, everybody here would benefit. If the Soviet Union were to cut their, as they would, cut their budget by 100 billion rubles, or 90 billion rubles, the exchange rate I think is 1.1 to 1, uh, they'd benefit twice as much. The reason being that the gross national product of the Soviet Union is only half of ours. So that uh, 100 billion dollars saved, devoted to used for the benefit of the people, will have twice as great value for the Soviet people as for the United States. Well, I remember Bertrand Russell saying that uh, if people would only work as hard to make themselves happy as they now work to make other people miserable, the world would be a wonderful place. Uh, I think it would be well worthwhile for us to make ourselves happy by saving a hundred billion dollars on these, this military uh, folly, even if it meant to making the people in the Soviet Union twice as happy, it meant an increment twice as great for the people in the Soviet Union. <laughs> so. Uh, why do the American people put up with this? The answer is pretty clear. Because they aren't told the truth. You know, I, I just wrote a check to the New York Times for $211 uh, to get the New York Times during the coming year. And I feel that I have to do it uh, in order to find out what's going on. I look at the comic pages in the San Francisco Chronicle, but uh, I also think I need to su and, uh, subscribe. I looked at the comic pages in the, what is it called here, the Grand Rapids something too. Uh, but uh, I feel I have to subscribe to the Soviet Union. And sometimes I wish I didn't, because I, uh, at $211, was $180 last year, $211 this year. At $211, I feel that I have to read it to get my money's worth. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I wish I didn't, hadn't read it. I read in the New York Times, Senators Christopher Dodd and Paul Sungus of the Foreign Relations Committee said, for us, it is conventional wisdom that the President of the United States lies. This was unthinkable 20 years ago. Shocking. I was shocked. I wished that I hadn't subscribed to the New York Times to get information of that sort. Well, just last week, the 20th of March, I read, once again, in a recurring pattern, President Reagan cites data in support of his policies, and the so-called facts are erroneous. He quoted facts about the situation of the farmers in the United States. The New York Times said they are erroneous. Even President Reagan's uh, spokesman said that uh, well, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture said the President misspoke himself. And the spokesman for the White House said, but it doesn't really matter whether the facts, what he called the facts, were true or not. And uh, a friend of mine who is a psycho psychologist uh, uh, sent me a little statement that he had written out. Uh, which, in which he was kinder than Senators Dodd and Tsongas, he said, uh, President Reagan K 
cannot distinguish between reality and fantasy. And then he went on to say what President Reagan had said and about the fantasy. Uh, and of course, it starts out with the Pentagon, usually. It uh, goes back a long time, too. Uh, I heard McNamara, not personally, but he was on television, talking about something that happened back in about 1961, perhaps, uh, when uh, he said, uh, when the Pentagon had said, there's a missile gap. We need to have $50 billion more because there is a missile gap. The Soviet Union is ahead of us, and so they got the appropriation. McNamara said President Kennedy asked him to check about this missile, missile gap. So he checked, got the information, and went back to President Kennedy and reported that there hadn't been any missile gap. A couple of years ago, Reagan was talking about the window of vulnerability. And after a while, the Joint Chiefs of Staff said there isn't any, wasn't any window of vulnerability. And uh, uh, Cap Weinberger, is that right, says uh, the Soviet Union is far ahead of us in weaponry. And so we need to have these extra 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion dollars. And these are just lies. They're not, they're devices. Well, I read an article in the New York Times with the title, Does President Reagan Lie? And the commentator reached the conclusion that he doesn't lie. He doesn't find out what the facts really are, but he has some convictions, and so he speaks. He's not lying, he's just telling what he believes. He's speaking in accordance with his convictions. I think that's too kind, actually, <laughs> uh, and that it isn't true. I was shocked. I, I happened. I, I was in New York and uh, getting ready to go to Europe. I canceled the trip, it happened, but I, at 10 o'clock in the morning in my hotel room, I was waiting for someone to pick me up. And I turned on television, and there was President Reagan talking. I hadn't known he was going to be talking. And I heard him say something. And uh, I wrote it down after shortly, and to be sure that I was right as to what I had heard, I wrote to the White House and got the transcript of his speech. And this is what he said, supporting Weinberger about the missiles, about the Soviet Union being hit. He said, over the last 10 years, the Soviets have devoted twice as much of their gross national product to military expenditures as the United States. Twice as much. See, that's a pretty, pretty strong statement. Everybody could say, well, Cap Weinberger is right. Here the president says they've been spending twice as much. But it didn't say, if you look at it carefully, it said twice as much of their gross national product as the United States. Twice as much of their gross national product as the United States. And uh, of course, that's pretty ambiguous. Uh, he could have said, during the last 20, 10 years, the Soviet Union has been devoting twice as great a fraction of their gross national product to militarism as the United States has devoted of its gross national product to militarism. And since uh, our gross national product is twice as great, that means that the amounts being spent are essentially the same. Well, this was deliberately worded in this way, uh, I'm sure. Uh, President Reagan, it, it's hard for me to believe that he is so incompetent and inept that he didn't know uh, that this sentence could be misunderstood in this way. So that's the way. That's why the American people allow this to go on. They are being, they're just being lied to all the time. And, well, here I picked out a cartoon. The cartoonist shows a reporter talking with the president. And he says, uh, uh, one question, Mr. President. 
if the Soviets really are militarily superior, why do you keep on insulting them? <laughs> well, there are other things that worry me. Here in Lebanon, just think what a mess there is in Lebanon. There are a half a dozen different religions scrapping with one another there. And that means you have five times six over three. I learned to do this. Five times six divided by two, three times five, 15. I learned this in high school in my course in advanced algebra. 15 different uh, pairs that the, Israel, the Israeli can fight against the Shiites, I guess. So the Shiites can fight against the Christians in Lebanon and so on, 15 different pairs. So you have lots of possibilities of conflict. But more than that, that sort of thing has been going on in Lebanon for 3,000 years. If you read the Old Testament, you see these different uh, religious groups scrapping against one another in Lebanon. And I had some interest in history. I just read a reporter sent me a clipping, uh, a photostat that he had made of a letter to the editor in an editorial in the Portland Oregonian in the spring of 1910. Uh, I knew that this, but I, I hadn't seen this editorial and letter for a long, long time. It got lost, but he dug them up and sent them to me. My father had written uh, to the Morning Oregonian saying that he had a son who had just turned nine who was very much interested in reading and he wanted advice about what his son should read. And he went on to say that, uh, don't say that he should read the Bible and Darwin's Origin of Species because he's already read them. And then went on to say, and he has a special interest in ancient history. I don't remember much of any of this, but uh, that's what it said in the letter. And the editorial gave some advice that I might read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, perhaps. But uh, so I've read some history. And uh, what happens? A lot of the suffering in the world has been caused by religions, religious wars, religious groups fighting one another. And of course, there's a reason for this because when religion comes in, rationality goes out. Uh, you have bias and dogma taking over, and it's hard to handle that. You have this problem in Iran uh, at the present time. So I was pretty upset then when I read the statement President Reagan made last year. There is sin and evil in the world. And we are enjoined by Scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose it with all our might, to support the nuclear freeze on nuclear weapons, you know, big effort being made, is to remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. This is just the sort of, of uh, thinking that can lead to the end of the human race. Well, so I think I understand why the American people allow this to be put over on them, because they are lied to. But why is the government doing it? Such an irrational course for the government to be following. Why do they do it? Well, here, President Reagan, Last, during his first term, issued the National Security Directive to explain, bringing things up to date in a sense because he was just repeating some statements that had been made earlier, to explain why so much of our money is being wasted on this, these military activities. It said that the president's policy toward the Soviet Union is a confrontational one designed to take advantage of Soviet political and economic weaknesses, to force international reform in the Soviet Union and the shrinkage of the Soviet empire. That the Soviet Union is now threatening vital American economic interests around the world. 
The order calls for putting economic, political, diplomatic, propagandistic, and military pressure on the Soviet Union. It's designed to give nuclear superiority to the United States, this directive says, uh, to involve more weapons, more United States forces abroad, more military aid to friendly re regimes, such as the dictatorship, Pinochet in Chile and other regimes, and uh, fewer restrictions on the CIA, on security actions. And the argument is that our gross national product is twice that of the Soviet Union. If we keep increasing our military expenditures, then fear will cause them, fear of war, much greater in the Soviet Union than the United States will cause them to increase theirs, to balance ours, and that will be twice as great a burden for the economy as it is for the United States. That we can afford to waste our wealth in this way, but that sooner or later the economic pressure will become too great and the, the communist uh, regime will be overthrown. Reagan spoke to the British Parliament in June of 1982 and said, we are engaged in a battle of ideas and values with the Soviet Union, with, e with economic and military pressures on them, with the goal to leave Marxism-Leninism on the ash heap of history. This is, you know, he has a religion, this religion of anti-communism that you have to save the world by getting rid of this uh, somewhat different uh, economic and political system uh, that uh, exists. A few months ago, he said, the Soviets are now at their limit. They can't increase their military expenditures. They have to recognize that they can't match us. Quotation from President Reagan. I heard Paul Warnke speak about world peace. He was, he's a former director of the uh, Arms Control and Disarmament Agency of the United States. He mentioned this policy of the United States of applying more and more pressure by increasing our military expenditures, developing more weapons. And he said, this effort will fail. It isn't going to work. He said, uh, if you understand the nature of the Soviet people, you'll see that it will fail. But he also said, they started out at the time of the revolution under the czars at such a low level economically that the people who run the country have been able to raise the standard of living a little bit each year, year after year and they'll continue to be able to lead, raise the standard of living a little bit despite this great burden of militarism. Well, of course, this X1 business doesn't make military sense. There was a time a few years ago when, uh, only two or three years ago, when there was much discussion as to how X1 uh, rockets could be installed. The other intercontinental ballistic missiles we had were installed in fixed silos where they were susceptible to attack by uh, the Soviet Union. If there were to be a nuclear war, they could be destroyed easily. So there were a lot of ideas. I think President Carter had the idea of building uh, great numbers of railroad tracks all through the United States or the western part and putting these rockets on railroad cars and shifting them around all the time so that the Soviet Union would always be behind in their spying and wouldn't know where to aim the rockets. And there were other ideas of having them be carried by airplanes that were flying around or located, put on submarines like the present uh, nuclear weapons that are carried by submarines, but carrying these big rockets too. One commentator said, this notion that President Reagan has 
that by spending two trillion dollars on weaponry in five years, we can force upon the USSR an arms race that will bankrupt them seems in its first year to be already in a fair way of bankrupting us, morally and spiritually, as well as economically. Well now, what has been approved by the Congress of the United States and the administration? It is to spend another one and a half billion dollars on 21 of these rockets to be installed in the same old fixed rocket sites as the earlier ICBMs. Just doesn't make sense. Uh, they'd be just as vulnerable if they are built and installed there. And of course, uh, this argument that we have to apply pressure on the Soviet Union, they're under this great pressure now. It isn't just that it costs them twice as great a fraction of their wealth as it costs us. Uh, there's more to it than that. Fifty times as many uh, Soviet people were killed in the Second World War as Americans. Every family, there's a whole generation of men missing, killed in the war. And uh, a million people died of starvation in the siege of Leningrad. And so on. They know what war is in the way that the people in the United States don't. And so they're pretty frightened, everybody, of the uh, militarism that's rampant in the United States. And do you need to put pressure on the Soviet Union in order to get them to sign reasonable agreements about disarmament? <clears throat> They're under great pressure. This pressure, this economic pressure that's twice as great and the fear that is far greater, 50 times as great, say, they're under pressure. More than that, they express over and over again, as you can see from available documents, they express over and over again the desire to start cutting the military budget. At the United Nations and in Vienna and in Geneva, year after year, 1976, 1977, 1978, 1979, they say, let's make an agreement to stop all nuclear tests. That would be a way of stopping development of additional fancy nuclear weapons because military people don't like to have weapons that haven't been tested. A new nuclear warhead they feel needs to be tested. I was on, uh, I was having a press conference in St. Louis at an ACS meeting with uh, Seaborg, Glenn Seaborg. Glenn Seaborg was a scientific, was a member of the AEC when the test ban treaty was made in 1962. And uh, he uh, went along with the negotiators. He was one of them. He said at this press conference, not to me but to the reporters, that uh, the Soviet Union wanted to have a complete, comprehensive test ban treaty but that uh, their delegation, the United States, had been instructed by the president not to make a comprehensive test ban treaty because the Pentagon was determined to carry out another 700 tests of nuclear weapons. And so the Soviet Union said, well, we'll allow three on-site inspections per year, Seabart said. And we said, that's not enough. And then they said, we'll allow five a year. And Seaborg said, we said that's not enough. And then they said the seven and then 10. And then finally they recognized what was going on, I suppose. And so uh, the partial test ban treaty was made. A complete comprehensive test ban treaty would have value also in helping to stop spread of nuclear weapons to more and more nations, which increases the chance of outbreak of a nuclear war. They've proposed several times a treaty to stop the development of new nuclear weapons, a treaty to begin cutting down on the size of the stockpiles of nuclear weapons, a treaty to stop the development of new systems of mass destruction. Over and over again, they make these proposals and we turn them down just because of the policy of the United States, I think, which is 
to continue to put economic pressure on the Soviet Union by forcing them to spend more money on militarism, to waste more of their wealth in that way. I heard uh, Dr. Caldecott speak just recently. Uh, she mentioned that there had been, a, I've forgotten, 108 false alarms about an attack on the United States that caused us to come close to a red alert or something like that. And that fortunately, all of these false alarms had turned out to be false alarms, our computer malfunctions. Then she said, uh, uh, we all believe, we know uh, that the Soviet computers are not so good as our computers. They have more false alarms, and perhaps they'll be fooled by one of these. So the best thing we could do to increase our safety would be to send our best computers over to the Soviet Union. <laughs> there is a chance that the world will be destroyed because of a computer misfunction of some sort. I had a friend, longtime friend, also like me, a physical chemist, he, uh, but he had a quite different career from mine. When I was a boy, then toward the end of the Second World War, uh, in Oregon Agricultural College, looking out the window of the chemistry building at the cows eating grass outside, uh, he was an officer in the white Russian army fighting against the Reds. And of course, alongside the 20,000 American soldiers that we had in Russia fighting against the Reds at that time, and the other British and French armies that were trying to defeat the Reds. And of course, all of these armies gave up. There was too much support for the revolution in Russia for them to be successful. So when when he was 19, perhaps, he was a laborer in Romania. And then when he was 20 or 21, he was a student of chemistry in Berlin. And pretty soon, when I got acquainted with him, he was an assistant professor of chemistry at Princeton. And then he became professor of physical chemistry at Harvard. And <clears throat> during the war, we worked together at the Central Explosives Research Laboratory in Brewston, Pittsburgh. I was there one summer. I don't know how long Kisti was there. And he disappeared. He went to Los Alamos uh, to design the conventional explosives that produce the implosion that reduces the volume of the fissionable material to the critical extent and leads to the detonation, the fission of the material. And then he was science advisor to President Eisenhower. And finally, he retired at uh, Harvard. And for 12 years, he was president of one of the anti-war organizations. I've forgotten which one. Well, I can't remember the name. And uh, then he died. Five days before he died, his last paper was published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. He reviewed uh, what had happened, uh, discovery of nuclear fission, development of nuclear weapons, and went on to say in this article, uh, nowhere did the prostitution of scientific integrity match that of the Atomic Energy Commission's technical staff including the weapons laboratories and extending to its present day successors the prostitution of scientific integrity, he says. Building more and more nuclear weapons, changing their nature. And uh, he said, the weaponeers are now rampant. Somebody, perhaps it wasn't a weaponeer, a weaponeer, uh, perhaps someone in the Bureau of the Budget was responsible for one change. 30 years ago, we had 2,001 mega, or 20 megaton, 2,020 megaton warheads, that would be 40,000 megatons. That was my estimate. We had 2,000 long-range bombers. Each one could carry a 20 megaton warhead. So 
This gave an idea as to how many. It was hard to get information then. Of course, everybody knows now uh, that there are 50,000 nuclear warheads in existence and running around a megaton, each smaller ones and bigger ones. Well, this fellow, whoever it was, said, uh, how many 20 megaton targets are there in the Soviet Union? You might use a 20 megaton target on Moscow. That would kill 10 million people there and smash the city. And you might use one on Leningrad. How many 20 megaton targets are there? How many 10 megaton targets? How many 1 megaton targets? How many 500 kiloton targets? And so on. Why not tailor the warhead to the target? And we have now, by that time, 1969, these intercontinental ballistic missiles, and we know a lot about computers and so on. So why not uh, put the 12 or 18 small rockets on the big rocket with their own warheads and their own uh, targets and computers and uh, have, have a weapon, a bomb, of the right size for every city down to 15 or 20,000 people in the Soviet Union. So that, that was the way Mervyn got going. But that's what the weapons were doing, the weaponeers were doing, Kislyakovsky said, developing these. And he says, <clears throat> and the enemy, by a carefully nurtured tradition, reinforced from time to time by misinformation fed to the public and to Congress. See, he's gentler than Senators Dodd and Tsongas were when they said the president lies. He just has misinformation fed to him. The enemy was identified as the Soviet Union. The Soviets, of course, kept up with us in most respects. And so, here we are possessors of some 50,000 nuclear warheads, more than enough to produce a holocaust that will not only destroy industrial civilization, but is likely to spread over the earth environmental effects from which recovery is by no means certain. He said, as one who has tried to change these trends, working both through official channels, he was advisor to President Eisenhower, and for the last dozen years from outside, I tell you as my parting words, forget the channels. There is simply not time enough before the world explodes. Concentrate instead on organizing a mass movement for peace such as there has never been before. The threat of annihilation is unprecedented, and so we must take unprecedented action to save the world. Kisti knew. See, he said, I tell you as my parting words. And he died five days after publication. He was writing a month or two earlier. He knew he was a goner going to die. And so that was his last message. So we don't need the MX missiles to apply pressure on the Soviet Union to make treaties. We need some way of applying pressure on our government to go ahead. The treaties our government has been willing to make have been treaties that did not decrease the expenditures on militarism. They would, be, would limit the number of some weapons, but allow us to go ahead and spend even larger amounts on other weapons. The policy is one of continuing to increase the expenditures. And this, of course, is uh, largely fostered by the defense contractors, the ones who put in uh, overcharges of $800 million, or I don't know how much, uh, billions of dollars perhaps, General Dynamics and General Electric Company and so on. Uh, here, Kisti was science advisor to President Eisenhower. Probably he may have been involved in writing this speech about beware of the military-industrial complex. 
Well, it perhaps has a stranglehold on our government and indirectly, of course, on our people. Well, I agree with Kisti. It's the people who are going to save the world, not the government. The people who are going to save the world. Don't think that you are unimportant. Every one of you is important. And is what should be done? What should any person do? What can one person do? It depends on the person. That is, I give lectures. That's the main thing that I do, give lectures. Not only here, but in the Soviet Union. My wife and I spoke at a peace meeting to a thousand people in the Soviet Union. Partially just as to show that it could be done, because the people, the scientists are mainly the people we know, and people in the peace movement, the Moscow Peace Committee, uh, the scientists, the people that we know say, we don't need to demonstrate because the policy of our government is to work for disarmament, to cut down the military burden, to get militarism under control. But we, when we said we wanted to give a talk, a public talk about world peace, and show a film that we had taken, or some commentator had made, a 20-minute film about the peace movement in Southern California, we did it. Not everyone, well, there would be too many speakers if everyone went around giving lectures about world peace. There are other things. When there's a demonstration, go out and take part in the demonstration. Write to your congressman. If your congressman, your senator, vote for MX missile and in general vote to increase the military budget, write to them. If enough people write to them, they get worried that they won't be reelected. So write to them. Write letters to the newspapers. Do everything, do whatever you can think of. Use your ingenuity to decide what you can contribute. So I believe that we are going to achieve ultimately the goal of a world without war. But it'll be a long time before we get rid of minor wars. I don't believe that we need an all-powerful world government. It might be too dangerous to have it. It's a good idea to have lots of different organizations working together, but with some control over them. We need a way we need to find a way, which I've discussed in some detail in my Nobel address, to uh, permit a people to overthrow an oppressive and dictatorial government without having to resort to violence, to a revolution. Uh, we need to work toward the goal of a world in which every human being has the opportunity to lead a good life, with good food. Too many people starve. Now, too many people are malnourished, poorly nourished. Even in the United States, we have a lot of poverty, a lot of uh, malnourishment. Uh, I remember when the Reagan administration said that the regulation that a school lunch must contain two vegetables can be handled by counting pickles and tomato, and, uh, uh, tomato sauce, uh, ketchup. Ketchup and pickles as vegetables. Uh, we need to... Uh, we, we need a world in which every person has clothing, proper clothing, housing. Every person has the opportunity to education to the extent to which he or she can benefit from it. Every person has a job. We need a world in which the political systems are moving toward a goal where there is more individual freedom, human rights. We know, all know about the human rights violations in the Soviet Union. We hear about that all the time. We need a world in which we do not have in the United States uh, seven or eight or 10 million people who would like to work, but because of the economic system are kept unemployed and do not have the uh, self-esteem that's associated with contributing to the work of the world and earning their own living. So we need to improve these systems. And of course, we, are, we need to protect the wonders of the world so that our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, future generations, if they live, will have uh, these wonders of the world to enjoy. 
protect the environment, protect the forests and the deserts and the uh, other, uh, the natural wonders of the world. Well, we need to have the number of people in the world that permits this goal to be reached. When you look at the underdeveloped countries and the problems that there are in them, uh, you see that it's going to be pretty hard to achieve this goal. I believe that uh, the basic ethical principle that we should all follow is that of working to minimize the amount of human suffering. Whenever a decision is to be made about alternative courses, try to estimate as well as you can the amount of human suffering associated with the alternative courses including future generations and, of course, multiplying by a negative exponential to take care of the fact that it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the future, but, uh, and then follow the path that seems to correspond to minimizing the amount of suffering. This comes pretty close. You know, I know what makes me suffer, and my Senses, observations tell me that what makes me suffer makes other people suffer too. And I feel that I would like to have other people behave in such a way as to minimize my suffering. Not if I'm a young man to force me to go off to war with a chance, good chance of being killed, vaporized in a nuclear attack, and, or burned with napalm or something like that. And I uh, think that other people, I think that it's my duty then to act in such a way as to minimize the amount of suffering of other people. And, well, I'm not the first to have used essentially this argument. Uh, who was it? Uh, Mark Luke. Luke, perhaps, said, As ye would that others should do unto you, do ye also unto them likewise. I'd like to see governments make decisions on the basis of ethical principles and members of Congress vote in accordance with their ethical principles. Well, I believe, I think we are fortunate that we live in such a wonderful world and at such a wonderful time and that we have the prospect that we can rid the world of this great evil, the evil of war, or at least do our part toward ridding the world of this great evil, and I hope that everyone will do what he can to achieve this goal. Thank you. I'm never satisfied after a meeting of this sort unless I uh, am asked some questions, preferably troublesome ones. Tru so, yes? Dr. Boyd, what do you think the possibilities are that we may be able to harness the power of nuclear fusion for productive, peaceful use? Well, the, uh, I think that chances are reasonably good. I shan't try to put an estimate on it that by the year 2000, perhaps, we may have some pilot plant, nuclear fusion plants. And, of course, it's likely that they'll be much safer than the nuclear fission power plants. For one thing, uh, you won't get the radioactive fission products, which are going to be a burden for future generations of human beings, the ones that we've amassed already. Uh, there's a possibility of producing a lot of radioactive carbon, the neutrons reacting with nitrogen in the air, but it might well be possible to handle that problem too, uh, the neutron-induced radioactivity. And uh, the supply of fuel for nuclear fusion probably will be very large. Lithium may be used, not just deuterium, I don't know. The progress that's been made seems to me to be pretty promising. 
I was fortunate to hear your, um, you talk last night on cancer and vitamins and such, and I wondered if you could elaborate on the connections between the resistance of the medical authorities to recognize cures and ways of dealing with cancer and that we have with the our government of resistance to alleviating nuclear war and weapons and Well, let's see. I don't know that I've ever been asked to do that before. The question is, could I discuss the resistance of the medical authorities to the use of vitamins as prophylaxis and therapeutics, an aid to the treatment of cancer patients and perhaps other patients, and the resistance of the politicians to rational actions toward cutting down the military budget. The, uh, I think that it is largely ignorance on the part of the medical profession that is involved here. And the ignorance, the way the ignorance comes in, and it isn't ignorance, perhaps with President Reagan, all right, but uh, there are a lot of smart people in the government that know just what's going on. And so it isn't ignorance on the part of the politicians, something else. Uh, the ignorance that I'm referring to is this. I make a great distinction between what I call orthomolecular substances, the vitamins and others normally present in the human body that have extremely low toxicity, and the toximolecular substances, the drugs that the doctors are always prescribing in far larger amounts than they could, so that 20 or 30 percent of illness hospitalizations are said to be uh, caused by the doctors themselves. The drugs that they prescribe, side effects from the drugs and so on. The doctors don't seem to be able to recognize that these orthomolecular, the orthomolecular substances are different from the drugs that these non-toxic substances don't have to be treated in the same way as the very toxic substances uh, that the pharmaceutical companies keep introducing and being tested. With these uh, toxic substances, it's quite proper to be cautious about them, to be careful uh, to find out whether there are long-term side effects that are more harmful for example, with, colo with uh, colorectal cancer, those Mayo Clinic people uh, started their paper by saying that no chem chemotherapy has value for patients with this kind of cancer. And uh, the method of testing a new chemotherapeutic drug is to try it cautiously on some patients. And if the patients don't respond, you stop the drug because the toxic effects may kill a patient. And they don't realize that you don't have to be that careful with the vitamins. Well, there may be one factor that operates in both of these fields, the economic factor. Cancer, treating cancer is big business. I just saw a report that the median income of physicians in the United States is $108,000 a year many of them up in the $500,000 a year range. And uh, hospitals, uh, you know, the cost of medical care is tremendous. There's a possibility that uh, people in this profession aren't interested in cheap substances that can cut down the amount of illness that they have to treat. Just as the defense contractors are not working hard to decrease the military budget. They're working in the other direction. So economic factors may be involved to some extent in the resistance of the medical establishment to innovation along these lines. But I think it's largely ignorance and uh, a lack of ability to think clearly in some of them. Yes? Diplomatic initiatives made a difference to the United States and China. The United States 
States and Russia don't appear to be able to do that at the government level. How do you feel about communication between people, non-government communication, as a way of dealing with the American and Russian problem? And how would you go about uh, this kind of communication? Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Is it that you are asking, how do I feel about communication between the American people and the American government? Would that be an initiative that could be as effective as the Nixon Kissinger initiative was with China? Well, I still don't understand now that you brought in the uh, Kissinger Nixon initiative with respect to China. Of, I don't think there's a real problem here. I think that it would be good if we had detente with the Soviet Union achieved by the Reagan administration. If we were to have a similar effort by a democratic government in this country, it probably would fail because of the vigorous attack on the Democrats from the Republicans as being soft on communism. See, it was a good thing that it was Nixon who opened up the doors to China because you can't accuse the Republicans of being soft on communism. The point being, however, uh, if in fact our government is not going to do it, and it's so important, can people do it? Well, there are things that uh, I had thought at first you were asking about communication between the people in this country and the people in the Soviet Union. And of course, this does occur to some extent. There are the, one encouraging thing is that physicians have finally become aware of this problem of nuclear war and have been pointing out that the medical problem, there'd be no medical treatment at all for the few the survivors of a nuclear attack. You just couldn't handle the medical problem. So we have, there is an international organization of uh, physicians for social responsibility uh, with the Soviet Union having one president uh, that is the president uh, there's a double presidency. One of them is in the Soviet Union, one professor at Harvard. And uh, there was a fine television program which was broadcast, uh, half of it being in San Francisco and half of it in Moscow with the American physician from Harvard in San Francisco and uh, the Soviet uh, physician whom I know, I, I know him, uh, the one who's the other president being in Moscow. And that was a great affair, I think, and uh, shows the sort of thing that can be done. So uh, there could be international efforts of this sort. Thank you.